Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Petapixel podcast. This week, we have a very special episode where we're going to be talking space with some of the folks that do the editing for the photos that are <laughs> released publicly from NASA and the European Space Agency. And um, we're really excited about that. So we're going to do that First, we're going to kind of mix up the format this week. Um, we still will get to a couple news stories that I know some of you have brought up in the comments of uh, our YouTube videos that you want us to talk about. So those will be in there. And then we'll get to our typical tech support and comment section as well. But uh, let's get going. We would like to thank our sponsor, OM System, for their continued support of the Petapixel Yay. podcast. Uh, being that our episode today is focused on the photographs of space, we thought it would be a great time to publish a comprehensive guide to astrophotography. In this guide, OM System Ambassador Peter Baumgarten talks us through the entire process for photographing the night sky. Learn how he plants his Milky Way photos, what he looks for in composition, the settings that he will use to capture photos of the night sky, and how he uses the rich and unique features of the OM-1 and OM-5 cameras to capture stunning photos of the Milky Way and Aurora Borealis. Uh, let's take a look at some of these photos. Let me pull them up and I will see if I can show those to you. He has some really stunning landscape photos here. All of these were captured oh, beautiful. on yeah. home system cameras. Um, I actually took a look at Michael's uh, write-up of um, Peter's photos yesterday. And this is a seriously detailed guide. <laughs> like, you could read specific sections of this and be perfectly happy to get just like a little bit of information that's focused mm. on something you want to do. But there's something that's covering all aspects of astrophotography. Yeah. So like it's in a table of contents, you can read whatever section you want, or you can read the entire thing. It's super detailed. Uh, I'm it, it's not like it's fantastic. You can do a lot of this with an own, own system camera, but you can do it with any camera that you have the, the tips that, that he, he has. Yeah, like I love that he he's got a lot of you know, what you call classic astrophotography landscapes, right? Looking for beautiful frames and, and foreground subjects and playing with light. But he also has like some very conceptual art pieces as well, which are quite, quite nice. Yeah, he uses a lot stuff. of foreground elements too, which is, yeah. uh, it makes for some really interesting uh, photography. So yeah, nice to read stuff. Mr. Baumgarten's nice. guide to astrophotography, visit the link in the description below or visit petapixel.com. Learn more about the incredible line of OM system cameras and the highly respected M's Weco lens series by visiting explore.omsystem.com. Thanks again to OM system for sponsoring this episode. So now that we're in the uh, the space frame <laughs> of mind, let's uh, go ahead and head into that interview. So we are joined by Joe DePasquale and Elisa Pagan. Both of them work for STSCI. Joe is the Senior Science Visuals Developer in the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope in Science Institute in Baltimore. Joe's work requires a unique blend of science and art to bring data from the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes to life in high quality, colorful views of the cosmos. Prior to joining STSCI in 2017, Joe was the science imager for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, where he worked for 16 years following his undergraduate training in astronomy and astrophysics, astrophysics, astro physics, gosh, Nailed I can't it. say that one, at Villanova <laughs> University. Joe has an extensive background in astronomy, fine art, and photography, giving him a unique skill set well suited to the task of bringing raw observatory data to the life, to life in richly detailed imagery. Elisa is a science visuals developer and who works with the Office of Public Outreach within the Space Telescope's Science Institute. Using her background in art and science, she works closely with astronomers to create color images of space, that are intended both to inform and showcase the beauty of the universe. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. We're really excited about this. Uh, on Petapixel, we talk a lot about what kinds of photography people can do at home, but we also focus on the types of photography that are being brought to us by some of the incredible technology that we've sent into space. So it's really great to have you here to talk to us a little bit about what that's like. Uh, to inform anyone who's listening who doesn't know anything about STSCI, 
Uh, STSCI was established in 1981, and that, that stands for the Sp Space Telescope Science Institute. They were established in 1981 as a community-based science center at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Mar Maryland. Uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute is operated by the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, ARA, and works closely with NASA and the European Space Agency. Much of STSCI's funding comes from contracts with NASA's research centers and laboratories. So I was talking to our writer, the guy who helped put this together for us, Jeremy, and he describes STSCI as kind of like, um, so NASA is like the bones and then everything else is like the skin. That's how he described it to me. So STSCI <laughs> is like organs and skin on top of what the b bones of NASA are. I don't know how accurate that description is. I hope he doesn't hate me for taking his words and butchering <laughs> them like that. Um, but uh, NASA is basically the core. And then there's a bunch of other organizations that are on top of that that do a bunch of things. So um, it's enough about me talking, trying to describe what you guys do. Um, Elisa and Joe, can you describe like what you do? at STSCI and then like how much interaction you guys have with scientists and physicists, physicists who work on web's data and like, what about the people on like the press relations stuff? Like, like describe your job so people understand what you do. <laughs> a day in the life. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Joe? Or do you want me to take no, that? Go ahead, Lisa. You go. Okay. Um, so yeah. So like a day in the life kind of starts, we work mainly with the news team. And so this news team is responsible, sort of sifting out the research that's out there. There's so much good stuff out there, but we can only put out so much in terms of our news releases. And so they contact the scientists there and so that we can get the data. And then we usually have like an initial meeting, depending on how complex the story is or the science is, to kind of discuss you know, what are they trying to communicate with this story? What is the discovery? How can we like enhance the story and the science with our imagery? So that's sort of the main thing that we do first. Uh, and then we collect the data either through directly from the scientists or we can go into the archive, which everyone can access. So it's all public domain, if not immediately within like six months, it's public. So anyone can go in there. It gets a little convoluted, <laughs> but you can go in there and sort of look around. So we download the data. Uh, and then it starts off black and white monochromatic. We're downloading separate filters or different wavelength ranges, uh, which we're collecting. And then we're assigning colors in chromatic order. And we can get into this, I'm sure. Uh, but the main idea is to select filters that best showcase what we're trying to communicate um, and highlight that information. So that's our job is basically creating color imagery from observatory data, from web, from Hubble, to create images that support these news releases. Right. And then just to add on to what Elisa was saying, um, as she mentioned, we do work closely with the scientists who have requested the, the time on the observatory. Uh, so it's not like a black box where we just sort of create an image out of their data and then that becomes the, pr the press release image. Uh, there is some back and forth. We'll do a few drafts. We'll make sure that their data is being represented in the best way possible uh, to advance the story that they're trying to tell with their science results. Uh, so there is a, a lot of collaboration with this work, and it's it's uh, very rewarding in that way. I guess something like, maybe back up a little bit. I, I think maybe people don't re realize this, but the pictures that we see from like the James Webb Space Telescope and Hubble, um, they don't look like what we see like published on NASA's like press page or on ESA or on the even the web the website the Webb Telescope site. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about like what you're actually seeing and then what you're doing with that? Like, how does that, how do, how do you turn what web sends you into pretty pictures? Sure. So, uh, like, as Elisa said, when we download data from the archive, it, it comes to us in grayscale imagery, sort of black and white. In fact, when you first open an image from web or Hubble or really any observatory, uh, it's going to look almost entirely black. Uh, and that's because the dynamic range of the instruments on the telescopes is so large that it can't be represented accurately on a screen or seen by your eyes. So one of the first things that we have to do is to what we call stretch or scale the pixel values in the image to be able to actually get to the details. Um, usually the details are buried in the darkness, which we like to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're all the way down at like, you know, if you're thinking of it in terms of a histogram, the left side is where the black levels are. And a lot of that information is sort of buried down in that region of the pixel values. And so we need to apply some kind of transformation to the pixel values to be able to pull out that detail. Um, we, we do what's called a nonlinear transformation. So we apply a function to the pixel values. Really all it's doing is it's just brightening the midtones and preserving the, the highlights so that you don't blow out your highlights 
uh, you know, as photographers are, I'm sure, familiar with, you don't want to, you know, drag your white point over to get to those details because then you're just going to blow out everything that's bright. And so stars and like cores of galaxies are going to become these big white blobs where you lose all that information. Mm -hmm. So we have to apply a nonlinear transformation to the pixel values to be able to preserve that information while also raising the values in the midtones and see the details. Uh, so that's a big part of the job. So the data looks strange, really, when you first download it. Um, like I said, it looks black. Once you've done this transformation to the pixel values, it is a grayscale, you know, black and white image. And it does look more like what you see in the final version. It's just it, it's not in color yet. Um, and that's because we, in all cases, if we're making a color image, we're going to combine multiple filters of data. And by filters, I don't mean like an Instagram filter. I mean, literally, <laughs> there is a wheel on the telescope a physical mechanism that puts different filters in the field of view. Think of it like uh, old school 3D movie glasses where you've got a red and blue um, filter on your eyes so that you can see in 3D. Um, that means, you know, light is being filtered for one eye for just to see red and the other eye is just seeing blue. Well, on the telescope, we've got many different filters that cover a wide variety of wavelengths. Um, for web, it's all infrared, but it's splitting infrared light up into smaller chunks of you know, like short wavelength infrared to long wavelength infrared. And that is the key to applying color to the images uh, in the chromatic ordering, which Elisa can explain more. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm curious guys, like, you know, if we're capturing all these different wavelengths of light and lots of infrared light, it doesn't look anything like how we would perceive it. So how do you guys decide what colors to put where and how close would that look to us, the human eye, if we were you know, able to see that with our own eyes? Yeah. Now that's great. And that is perfect lead in um, from uh, what Joe was saying. And that, <laughs> yes, we use, we assign things at what we call chromatic order. And all that means is that we're using the physical meaning or the way that I, our, our eyes work in the visible. So we perceive light that is sh at shorter wavelengths to be bluer. And then we perceive light that is at longer wavelengths to be redder. So we're applying that same mechanism or the same way that we see light to the infrared so that we take the shorter wavelength filters and make those of the bluer colors and assign them that way. And so it's just a color mapping or shifting of one color space into the, another that we can recognize. Now, there is a level of translation here because we don't know exactly how we would see in the infrared light. And so this is our best sort of guess, but using like actual physical meaning of what colors represent in visible light. So we're just kind of translating it into that. And I like to think of it sort of as music where sort of the relationship between the notes is the same, but you can change the octave. Um, so we're scaling it down, we're shifting it up, we're shifting it down. In this case, we're shifting it down to the visible light. So that's how I think about it. So you're not just so making cool. it up. I think that's something that's something. Yeah, you're not you're just, you're just like, for us. it's going to look pretty in pink. So we're going to throw some pink in there. Right, right. It's well, more yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're not like, oh, we like this color. So we're going to make it this color. It's, no, we actually use the scientific sort of relationships in order to apply them. And of course, there is some work after that that's a little bit more subjective. But yeah, it always starts with keeping the integrity of the data. It always stems from the science. Yeah, so we when can't you get that, that sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious because James Webb has been up for a year now. Like the data that's coming from that, um, compared to what you saw before with Hubble, like does that give you more flexibility in terms of what you can do in post? Um, you know, how does the raw information that comes back from James Webb compare to what we had before? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's Remarkably for us, it's very similar, the process of creating color images for web um, when compared to Hubble. Uh, it's just that we're now working in infrared instead of optical wavelengths, but even Hubble can see somewhat into the near infrared. So we, we have some familiarity with working with infrared data from Hubble. Um, I think some of the interesting characteristics of web data are that the lower or the shorter wavelengths of web data are really high resolution. Those files are, are gigantic. And in some cases, those the, uh, the shortest wavelengths that the web is sensitive to is actually higher resolution than what Hubble can provide at optical wavelengths or, or infrared wavelengths, sorry. So that's been interesting is that we can you know see in more clarity and more detail at these wavelengths than we've ever had before. Um, and I think that you know it doesn't really change how we approach the data in terms of image processing, but it really is just fascinating to see all these details for the first time at these wavelengths. It's like you got a brand new camera that you get to play with, right? <laughs> yeah, like super high resolution, really sensitive. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> this might be a question that has a really complicated answer, but I'm just curious, like, 
what is the advantage of using the Webb uh, telescope over what we've had traditionally? What, what, what do we get from the infrared wavelengths yeah, that we wouldn't get before? That's a great question. And um, I will start with saying it's kind of the same as why we have different medical equipment to study different parts of our body. We're understanding our body in different ways. So like MRI machines mm. are looking at sort of your soft tissue uh, versus like an x-ray machine that's looking at your bones. We're essentially doing the same thing with these telescopes. So like with Hubble, we're seeing sort of what's on the surface, kind of like our skin. So we're just seeing sort of the dust and the gas and the stars, but we're seeing more of the dust in front of it so because we can't see through that. And then with infrared, right. not only do we get sort of the ability to see through this dust, so we're kind of seeing the bones more. If we go into the mid-infrared, um, we can actually see this dust admitting. And even going further, infrared is just far more sensitive at picking up uh, particular forms of light that correspond with very far distances or early galaxies and stars. So there's this phenomenon called cosmological redshift, and that just means over time space has been expanding. And so the light that travels to us also expands or shifts into the red part. So all that early stuff, all that like really cool stuff that we can only find in infrared, um, yeah, that's why we need web in order to see those first stars and galaxies. So when you first got the first data from Webb last year, and I'm, I'm looking at some of your favorite pictures that you pointed to us, one of them was Pillars of Creation. As I recall, that was one of the ones that was part of the first group that went out. So you guys were there seeing the original stuff come in before anyone else did. Can you just like describe what that's like? Because I personally... <laughs> was so stoked about these pictures when they first came out. So I can't even imagine what it's like for you guys working on them and seeing these things, the raw data, and just seeing new stuff for the first time in, in for a really long time. Yeah, that, that was just an incredible moment. Um, and actually, the pillars came a little bit later. That was, I think we released that in September. Uh, oh, but it it was within like sort of the first... Uh, yeah, we, we designed that observation to sort of fill in the time period after those first ones went out, but before we started getting science results and could do like a regular cadence of press releases. Uh, so that's where the pillars came from. The first one that actually came down was the Tarantula Nebula, 30 Doradus. And that one, um, I had the opportunity to work on that. Those were the first data sets to come down from web that we had intentionally designed for outreach imaging for this, you know, EROs, what we call uh, early release observations. So the very first color images from web. And I remember when we started seeing the initial data sets from that, uh, we had a meeting. In fact, there was a, a six week period where we put all of that ERO material together, which was just insane. It was like the most intense work period I've ever had in my life. Uh, we met every single day, weekends included, uh, with the, the science team, the EROs team, and uh, we worked through the data. And so when those first data sets started coming down, um, Klaus Pantapadon, who was the, uh, he was the, um, the head of the uh, mission office for w uh, web at the time, and he would lead those meetings and he start started showing those first data sets of 30 Doradus and the detail that we could see just in like the black and white images, just at a quick look, it was like amazing. It was the first real indication that, yes, yeah, that everything's working perfectly. Um, I wouldn't say it was the first indication because we did know that the mirrors were totally focused and that first image that showed that star in focus. Yeah, that was also yeah, really incredible, yeah. right? Because we, yeah. we, not only did you see that star like in perfect focus, you also saw a background just littered with galaxies. And that was like our first indication that pretty much anywhere you point web for any amount of time, you're going to get essentially a deep field image and then also whatever you're looking at. Yeah. So that was really cool. And just to like, um, but, oh, sorry, Joe. Yeah, sir. Go ahead. Oh no, no, no. You can you finish. I was. You just got me excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with thirty Doradus, yeah, that one. When I first put the color image together, um, oftentimes when this kind of work, you can kind of get lost in the details. You know, when you're zoomed all the way in, working at the pixel level, you kind of you, you get tunnel vision or pixel vision, I guess you could call it. And I remember at one point I just took a step back. I like literally backed up in my chair, zoomed out to see the full image. And it hit me like how incredibly detailed and richly colorful this image was. And cause that was another thing we were a little bit concerned about was like, what is the infrared universe really gonna look like? Is it gonna be as richly colorful as we see with Hubble? Or is it gonna be kind of, you know, paler or uh, just not as vibrant, but that, <laughs> It was all turned on its head in that moment. And for me, that was just a really powerful moment to know that everything is working perfectly. The image is incredibly vibrant and full of detail. 
And I am literally the first person in the world to see this. And I, and if, in a few weeks, it's going to be seen by millions to billions of people. That was an incredible yeah. moment. I, I want to go off of that because like, I think it's easy to look at all these images. And I'm sure a lot of the fascination, a lot of the joy comes from seeing data you've never seen before or you know, seeing the birth of stars and things like that. But at the same time, they're also really beautiful images, right? And, you know, uh, Elisa, you were just saying, you just got really excited there. Like before this interview, you were talking about one of your favorite images. It was in the uh, Ro Ofuyuki cloud. And uh, I think it was to celebrate Webb's first birthday. But uh, why Why was that like, because we had to remember, these are, these are scientific achievements, but they're also beautiful photographs. What did you love about that photograph? There, there's a lot that I love. And one of it is also just the fact that it's marking Webb's first anniversary, the fact that it's done so much in so little time and just to kind of look back and see how far we come, which is very exciting and then very kind of indulgent. And it was also nice to do it in a space where, you know, we didn't have like two days to put something out. So it was kind of more of a relaxed position to be in than the first images that were going out. And along with that, there is a sort of level of comfort that we built, like we built a relationship with Webb. Like in the beginning, we had some simulated like simulated data to work with just to kind of understand the web data, but you don't really know and you don't really develop the techniques in order to work with the data and web data and showcase it properly mm. until you sort of worked with it more. And so it was just nice to have this sort of culmination of all these techniques that we've developed over time to work with this data and be like, yeah, I know how to work with you. Like we got a synergy going. <laughs> like, <I know> you. <laughs> what's, what's it like? post-processing one of these images compared to, you know, like a, an image, a terrestrial image, so to speak, here on Earth? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Joe, since you're, you do photography work, I'll let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think one of the interesting things that we have to deal with with web is like a whole new um, noise profile. There's what we call one over F is to read out noise from the detectors and it creates these sort of striations or lines that run across all of the data. Um, it's more prominent in the shorter wavelengths, which are the higher resolution files. So we had to come up with some techniques for dealing with that. We're still sort of learning as we go. Um, sometimes the techniques work really well. Sometimes they actually don't. It's especially if you have like a, a mosaic image where you've got multiple images together, stitched together. Sometimes those lines don't quite line up. And a lot of the tools that are designed to deal with that kind of noise, they want to see like perfectly straight lines running across the image, right? Which we don't have. Um, right. We could go back to the original data set from the archive and sort of reprocess it through our pipeline processing, but that's like really involved process. And when you're de dealing with mosaics with web, the file sizes just balloon incredibly mm -hmm. fast. Um, so we've been working with different tools to figure out, you know, ways to deal with that noise. There's the... Um, bright stars that saturate the detector. Uh, the way the pipeline deals with that is, is it sets those pixel values to zero so that astronomers know, okay, there's no useful data at the core of this star. But for us, mm. what that ends up doing is creating lots of stars that have black holes at the centers of them, which does mm. not look normal. <laughs> yeah, mm. It's not what your eyes want to see. You've got a big bright star with these huge diffraction spikes, and then there's a black hole in the center of it. Like It doesn't make any sense. So you just clone stamp white on there. Is that what you do, Joe? Just <laughs> put a white circle on everything. You know, if, if it comes to that, that I have done that, I will admit, but I've tried to develop <laughs> algorithms to deal with this sort of like on a more um, algorithmic basis. So we don't have to do that. Uh, luckily, there's, you know, I, I, we use PixInsight. I use PixInsight probably more than Elisa does, but um, for, for processing the data, um, the initial color composite, that's sort of my workflow is starting in PixInsight. And PixInsight has such a great and active user community that have developed all these like additions and tools that can modify the way some of the tools work. And I did some searching before web was launched because we knew this was going to be an issue dealing with these star cores. Um, and somebody had written a script that was like an add-on to PixInsight that allows you to go in and it was it was for dealing with one shot color cameras of the sky, uh, color camera images of the sky, where stars are saturated in one of the particular color channels. And so you get like a magenta core in the star instead of white. Um, so it wasn't quite doing exactly what I wanted to do. So <laughs> I downloaded that code and modified it so that instead of doing, you know, a, a threshold where it's above a certain maximum, it's actually looking for a minimum. And then it goes in and just replaces those black pixels with the neighboring pixel values, which are almost always going to just be white pixels. Uh, almost maxed out, like 255. So that actually works really well, and we use that um, pretty frequently. Um, when it fails, then that's where we have to resort to maybe clone stamping or, or something. <laughs> <laughs> we can't leave those ho holes there. No. Yeah. So are you uh, using Photoshop, or is that is that 
or are you using only this other specially designed software? Uh, I use a, a combination of PixInsight and Photoshop. I'm really curious because you're like developing how you edit these files over time. Like you said, you're getting more comfortable with the images coming off web. Do you get the urge to go back to like some of those first images that you had and with all the stuff that you've learned in the last year, like, Hey, we could really judge this thing a little bit more. (laughs) Or do you just like kind of walk away? Like, you know, that was a huge project. I never want to look at that ever again. You know, where are you with that? That's the danger zone. (laughs) Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, like definitely there are times where I want to go back, um, especially like Karina Nebula, which is like very, you know, well known image at this point. But there are certain things I'd like to change in terms of like the treatment of the stars, because now I've actually there's so many stars and web images. You're just like completely overwhelmed with them that I've been trying to extract them and then putting them back, but extracting them so you can build sort of uh, the signal up in the background without sort of saturating the stars. And I feel like being able to treat them separately is like very powerful way to handle it. And so, yeah, I kind of like, Oh man, I could, you know, change that star right there, but it's fine. (laughs) I don't want to like change everyone be like, that doesn't look like the Karina Nebula stuff. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> How much yeah. time can you spend on like one image? It really varies. Um, you know, for the EROs, we were under such a tight time constraint that everything had to be done as fast as possible. Um, but I actually did like three or four variations of the deep field image of SMAX 0723 um, because we that was a really difficult data set to work with. We had a lot of those noise issues I was talking about. Uh, it's a mosaic. So we actually had varying background levels. And so I was getting like, you know, squares of brighter regions and squares of darker regions. And all that had to be mm-hmm. sort of equalized. Um, and there, the pipeline processing software wasn't quite ready to do that at the time. And so that had to be done manually uh, with basically curves adjustment layers in Photoshop. That was, <laughs> like, if you, you look at that PSD and how file, long did you have to work on that? Like, <laughs> what was the total, like you got the image and then how long did you work on it? And then you had, it had to go. You got the data, work, yeah. gone. It was, I think, the final version of it that I did. I did it in four hours, and then it was out the next day. Oh, For Biden. <laughs> but, yeah, then Biden did it. <laughs> um, but that one, that was after, like, I think two or three other iterations, which I'd probably spent, you know, four to five hours on each of those as well. So it wasn't like, wow. I did it in four hours. You know, it's accumulated over time. I had some knowledge of what I was working with. Okay, but still, it's still eight to ten hours. That's still... <laughs> Very fast for how pretty that you that's S, uh, you say smacks or S M A C S. We we jokingly say smacks, but I think it's S smacks is it, it, the uh, technical S-max. term. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the first images, or was it the first one that was unveiled by President Biden? I can't remember yes. which was the exact. It was okay. That yeah, was the first like, one. Yeah, I remember tuning into that live stream, and I was just glued to it. I was like waiting for the pictures. Like I was so excited to see all those. Yeah, <laughs> on the uh, same kind of took the. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, on the same token of like the excitement of unveiling the images, I'd love to know, like, you know, the scientific community hands off their data to you. Are you then like discussing with them like, you know, oh, this information that we've got here, I'm thinking, you know, it should be processed in this way. Or are you just kind of showing it to them once you're done editing and they have no idea what they're going to see back? Like, what is their reaction to the final processed images. In general, I think they know what to expect because even if they don't do like full post-processing work, they might like create sort of a quick visualization in like DS9, Um, but it's not like powerful enough in order to get like those faint details. So I'd say most of the time they're very excited because they're seeing sort of their data in sort of the highest, cleanest quality as possible. And so there's usually a lot of excitement there. Um, Sometimes if it's a little bit more technical work, like very, very science focused, um, there'll be definitely a back and forth of like, oh, you know, maybe I want sort of that iron feature to stand out more because that's what this paper is about. So it is sort of like an iterative process in that way. So we won't just kind of go rogue. They kind of know what to expect. (laughs) and We'll show them what we come up with and they'll be like, yes. Or they'll be like, you know, maybe just tweak that a little bit. But for the most part, it's like, (laughs) yeah, I feel like there's some people and by that i mean mostly people like me who see what's coming off of web and what's being published as like this is the best computer desktop background generator <laughs> that we've ever produced <laughs> and that's all i think of it as like this picture is so cool and i just throw them on my I, like for a while there i had three separate photos uh that were taken from web and i'm just like i just sit here and look at them because they were so pretty but it's i have to remember that there was a point to doing this. There's like research or like there's demands, science demands behind each of these images. Um, 
And it's like, that's something I, I don't know that a lot of people think about. Cause like I'll see a press release sometimes on like NASA's website and there's like two paragraphs from a picture that was, mm-hmm. that's come off Hubble. And it's like, I don't really know how this relates to the science at all. And it's like, do you, do you think that there's a, a challenge or do you care if people really don't go beyond the surface little, Oh, it's pretty. Or do you, do you think there's, they should look into more? I, I don't know if that question's clear. I just like, you know, I, they're just pretty pictures to a lot of people. And I think there's more to it than that. <laughs> oh, there's definitely more to it, but I'm, I'm happy if people engage at all with, <laughs> with what we produce. Yeah. You know, if, if people see this and it causes them to, even for a moment, just ponder the universe, then that's a win for us, right? We're just trying to reach as many yeah. people as possible. And if they want to go deeper, they absolutely can. We have all that information. Um, our writing team is top notch. They're really great writers. They know how to take, a uh, really complicated story and distill it down into something that makes sense to the layperson who doesn't have that science background, right? They lay out the, the background that you need for just that one story. And, um, and they're really, really great at describing the images for you. So we have like the alt text that goes along with all of our images and our writers, they spend a lot of time thinking about how can we accurately describe what we're seeing here in a way that would help someone who has like blind or low vision understand what they're seeing. Very cool. I mean, that's, you know, that's a good segue too, Joe, because it's one of the most beautiful things I find about just the cosmos in general and space in general is, you know, how imperceptible the size is and the magnitude and, and just the sheer amount, I guess, just very simply the sheer amount of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we get to see that stuff after someone explains it, or it's put on a TV show, or you guys build it into an image and show us, right? But for you, the actual people diving in to do that, it's got to be so much more overwhelming, right? I mean, is it, do you ever reach that point where it's like so much information, so much data? Do you find it overwhelming? Uh, do you find it, you know, a different process than how, like you say, the layperson gets to absorb it? I'll let Joe get into this too, because I think he has a really cool way of explaining it. Um, but yeah, I think it's overwhelming. and But I also think like we have to compartmentalize a lot. And I don't know if Joe feels the same way, but when we first get the data, I feel like I almost have a little bit of blinders on just initially so I can really mm. see it in sort of a different way or else I'm going to get so distracted that I'm not going to be able to like get the job done. So I think initially there's a compartmentalization there. There. And then it's actually kind of after you've done all the work and you get to step back, or even if Joe is working on an image release that I'm not a part of, and I get to see it from the first time, that's also like its own sort of satisfaction there. Because you don't see the work, you just see this beautiful piece. And you really get to experience sort of the, the whimsicality and the grandeur of space. Um, so yeah, we'll <laughs> take a time. Like a lot of times after it's done, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, how do I get to be able to do this? Like, it's just a, like a huge honor and it's mind boggling and I could go down this huge rabbit hole, but I try to <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay above. Yeah. I often say that I have to pinch myself like one, at least once a week. Cause I can't believe like we get to do this and it's our job, but that's also a key point, you know, to what Elisa was saying, it is our job. And so we have a job to do. We have to dig in and, you know, sort of, put on the blinders and just focus on the task at hand, get this image ready. And then we get that moment to step back and sort of absorb it in the way that someone just reading the news would see it. And in those moments, that's where I I find that it, it, it can be overwhelming, but it also, for me, it kind of drives home the point that we're all really connected And these images give us a window into that connection, right? We're looking, in some cases, we're looking at the raw materials that make up the earth, the world, us, like the, you know, the the calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, all of that stuff. We're seeing that through these images. And so it's giving us a glimpse into our origins and it's helping us to understand our place in the universe. And so when you get those moments where you feel overwhelmed and how insignificant we are compared to the, the immensity of space, it's really more about how intimately connected we all are to each other and how intimately connected we are to these images and what they're telling us. Uh, I will be the first to admit here that I have looked at either artistic renderings based on like data that they've come in. It's just like, you know, there's no picture there, but there's lots of data. And I've also looked at the pictures that have been produced and I have legitimately sobbed when I looked at some of these pictures, thinking about all of what you've just described. Um, yeah. My wife thinks I'm super weird. Like she came in, it's like, is everything okay? And I'm just looking at pictures of space. And she just, she, anyway, anyway uh, somewhat, re- somewhat related to all that. Do you guys like how much, how often do you collaborate on single images? And do you ever like work on the same image together in a single release or are you kind of both doing your own thing? 
Yeah, it's a little bit of both, I would say. There's um, mm-hmm. nowadays, because of the cadence of the news, since we have Web and Hubble, we tend to kind of work on the separate releases at the same time just to get them out. But there are times where either like we'll work on one simultaneously just because we're, we're not sure how this should be processed and we just kind of want to explore the ways and see each other's process and be like, okay, that one works better or this technique seems to be working better. And then also times we just collab. <laughs> we're like, okay, I'll start it. And I'll be like, hey, you want to try your hand at this and just pass it on? <laughs> um, so yeah, it could go pretty much any way. Yeah, we really, I, I value our working relationship in that way because um we each have different approaches to how we start processing an image. Um, as I said, I work in PixInsight. Elisa tends to work with uh, Fitz Liberator, which is a, a free tool that allows you to do the image stretching that I was talking about earlier, and then take it from there to Photoshop. Um, so, you know, taking those different approaches and sort of comparing and contrasting what we get when we do that is very valuable. And then also having the confidence in each other's skills and abilities to be able to pass something off from one person to the other and know that it's going into good hands and we're going to finish this project and it's going to be great. Uh, it's really, it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you guys have anything ask, else you want to ask? Yeah, I need to ask questions of a photographer because every time I see these, you know, we test lenses all the time. And uh, we always talk about sun stars, and you guys get the most beautiful sun stars. You know, there's beautiful points coming off of everything. Is that is that natural? That's part of the optics? Do you guys <laughs> embellish that? What's going on? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely part of it. We, we're not adding that in there. I know some people beautiful. have accused us of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with the way that the, the telescopes are designed, right? That's why Hubble's and Webb's look different. Yes, yes that's exactly right. Um, the Webb's mirror is a hexagon. And it's made up of 18 individual hexagons. And every time you have an edge in an optical system, it's going to impart some optical artifact, which is this diffraction spike, right? Which is perpendicular to those edges. And so for the hexagon, you get the six spiked stars on all bright point sources in a web image. But then additional to that, there are these supporting arms that hold the secondary mirror up. There's three of those. And uh, they put the line that runs right across the center of stars so you get actually eight points for all web stars. Right. Um, compare that to Hubble, where you've got a circular mirror, so you sort of get this like blobby diffraction pattern that emanates from a point source. And then on top of that, you have the supporting struts that hold the secondary mirror. That gives you the, the iconic sort of four-pointed stars that you see in most Hubble images. So then, I mean, it, it, they look beautiful, of course. <laughs> I mean, but scientifically, is that something that you want to eventually overcome in the future when with new telescopes? I mean, is that, does that block detail? Does that diffuse detail that you want to capture? So there are ways algorithmically to program those out. It's just a little bit hard because based off of where it is in the detector is going to change it a little bit. So it's not like the PSF is mm. consistent throughout the image. So this is something you can do though, when you're looking at mm, specifically like, comets or exoplanets or anything that's like hidden in it uh, or there's details that are sort of being uh, overshadowed you definitely we do do work usually with the pi can do it the scientists can do it or we can do it where we remove those details just so that we can actually see the details when it comes to like star forming regions like these larger regions where there's kind of spikes that's not usually a huge deal and it doesn't like obstruct the science in any way because they're getting spectra they like the stars it's fine <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. but like for us um yeah so in terms of like when there's a huge star fields we don't really worry about those but yeah for like those smaller um tighter objects where those spikes become more of an issue then we can remove them specifically for those and in terms of aesthetics, those spikes have actually sort of come to be known as like they're a marker of a bright star in an image. It's like sort of culturally, we're conditioned yeah. to see those spikes and think, oh, that's a bright star. And the, you know, the bigger they are, the brighter the star is. So it's become <laughs> it's sort of a, uh, a key part of the imagery in some way to have those spikes there. No, that's great. Actually, you mentioned that, Joe. Remind me. Um, yeah, they're like a, almost like a, like a, so like, for AGN, they're super, super bright. Sometimes you wouldn't be able to notice that there's like a super massive black hole that's really active. Um, but those diffraction spikes are actually signaling that. They're like, if you see these diffraction spikes uh, that's not a star, you're like, oh, like there's something happening there. So we've actually had discussions on whether we want to remove these or not, but found that it's actually clearer in the science message to have the spikes so that they know there's something very, there's a huge bright source there. I did not know that. That's cool. Very cool. 
Um, well, we're not going to keep you guys too much longer. I just wanted to ask you if, like, anyone listening is like, okay, this is a very cool job. You basically get to edit <laughs> pictures of the universe and share them with everyone on here on Earth. How how could someone pursue a career doing what you guys are doing? Because there's there can't possibly be that many of you. And like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm jealous of your job. <laughs> I think Elisa probably has a better answer to that than I do. So I'll let you go. Okay. First. Yeah. I, we have different like paths, but I think um, definitely a lot of that is luck, but also just kind of doing what you love. At least that's worked for me. Like I have the privilege to do what I love. And I, I would like to think that everyone could do that if they were dedicated to it. I have a background in art and design. That was my first degree actually at Towson University. Um, mm -hmm. That wasn't good enough. I'm like, I love astronomy. <laughs> so now I'm going to get an astronomy degree. I don't know how the two were going to come together. So I had a very like meandering path. And I think my parents were probably worried too. But I was like, <laughs> I really like these things. I didn't think about it. Um, and it wasn't until observational astronomy where, you know, you take your own data. We have an observatory on the campus. You perform your own data analysis. Um, and that, that's what really dawned on me that there is like post-processing work to these amazing images that I was seeing of Hubble at the time. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. So I, I know someone's doing that. How do I do that? Cool. So it's kind of like a combination <laughs> of luck, this specific skill set that's kind of very nuanced. And um, also just knowing that this was a possibility, because I think a lot of people don't actually know this is something that you can do or there is someone actually doing this. Um, so I just learned about Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the best place to work in my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> um, and I saw a science visual developer position. I had actually applied to Space Telescope Science Institute for a while in different positions um, that were not quite, you know, the perfect fit, but I was like begging to just be a part of <laughs> Space Telescope Science Institute. And I will always remember, because I was interviewed by Max Mutchler uh, for one uh, one particular position at the time, which is instrumentation analyst. And he was the manager of the instrument team for Hubble. And I was just describing like why I was excited to be a part of the team. And it was really calibration work for the instruments. And he's like, you know, I just think you're going to be bored with this job because I guess I was like focused more on sort of the, the imagery post-processing rather than the calibration of the instruments. And at the time yeah. I'm like, don't you do this to me. I want to go there. But he was doing <laughs> me like a huge favor because later down the line, this, this job came around and it was just like perfect fit. So yeah, perfect. that's, that's my story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, it I, sounds like the public get to be a part of this experience. I mean, as you're saying, Joe, like people are, are writing plugins, they're creating and adding, you know, filters and such to the software. So people can be a part of this whole process in some way, can't they? And all the data is public, right? You can, if yes. you wanted to do your own edits of these things, you totally can. Absolutely. Yeah. It does take a little bit of knowledge of how the archive works and how to get to the data that you want to actually work with. Um, but you know, that's not an insurmountable thing. You can, you can learn that. And then you, you have a, a full access to the data, the data that we use to make our images. It's all there. Hmm. I'm going to drop it in Lightroom this afternoon and see what I can come up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, Elisa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to have significantly more information um, because we've already we spent 40 minutes and we only got through a few questions. We have so many more things that we've asked you. We have all of the images that you've shared with us, your favorite the uh, images that you've worked on uh, in a story on Petapixel. There will be a link in the description um, so you can check all that out. And I'm going to try and see if our system can hold one of your PSDs, one of your smaller ones, not the full one, because they're <laughs> massive files, just to yeah. give people an idea, like they can download that Photoshop document and see what you've done for themselves. And I think that is going to be really cool. So I'm going to do my best Very to cool. get that on there. And if I can't get it into our system, I'll put it on Dropbox or something so everyone can actually download it and check it out. But um, thanks again so much for joining us. We really appreciate thanks, it. Guys. Thank oh, you. Thanks for having us. It's Thank a pleasure. So thanks so much. So what do you think, guys? <laughs> did, you, yeah. did you enjoy talking to, to uh, so Lisa cool. and Joe? Yeah, very cool. Very, very interesting to see how in some ways it is quite similar to what we all do. You know, you're talking about, well, I mean, even going into Photoshop, right? And, and putting on stuff and, and sometimes cloning things in and sometimes, you know, using different filter effects and stuff. But at the same time, of course, how cosmically different it is from shooting here on land. And yeah, it was it was really enlightening to see the connections and to see the similarities and also just crazy technology that they're utilizing. 
Yeah, I think it's really cool to see that it's all actually based on the data. My assumption was because we're outside the visual spectrum, they'd be like, here's a black and white image. We're just going to treat this like a coloring book here and make this. <laughs> paint it. That's make it not juicy. an uncommon thought. Like yeah. that, I, I remember I did a podcast with a, uh, with like a NASA guy, um, God, maybe even 10 years ago before like web was even something we were even considering. And like, that was one of the main things, but you see it online. Like people, are, they're just making this up. It's all, it's all part of the man's plot strategy that control <laughs> us in some way. I don't really know how that really works out, but you know, space is actually boring in reality. <laughs> yeah. The, how dare they, they make up these colors. They're just trying to get us to fly to Mars. <laughs> but anyway, that was, that was, a, I'm really happy we had a chance to do that because I think what they do is super cool. And I don't think a lot of people know that, they do it. So I'm glad yeah. you guys enjoyed yeah. it too. Huge honor. All right. We are going to bang through the rest of this episode. We only got a couple things to talk about because that was a particularly long segment, but um, I wanted to point this out because you guys just finished your R100 review. We'll do comments on that one next week. But um, did you guys see that Canon mm -hmm. has a hot shoe problem? Were you guys aware <laughs> of this prior to our coverage of it? Because this was surprising to us. We did not know this was an issue. I was not. The only time I've had a hot shoe problem is when I drop a camera on the ground with a flash on it. That seems to be... The that's a Chris problem, problem, not a hot shoe yeah, problem. Yeah, that's a Chris but, problem, you're right. Uh, but, it, I mean, it makes perfect sense just given, you know, the ability, the inability for you to... Because I've tightened lots of hot shoes before, back when we worked at the camera store. Generally, there's just, you know, a little screw right in the middle, easy to fix with a jeweler's screwdriver. But, yeah, to move the pins to inside the camera body so you've got to disassemble it to repair it. I mean, I wouldn't say loose hot shoes are necessarily a huge issue, but if it's going to void your warranty to fix it yourself, then that is a huge issue. <laughs> yeah. And people are anyways. They're doing yeah, it. Yeah, they're doing because the, <laughs> apparently like if you try to take this to a can of repair center, they'll charge you hundreds of dollars to fix it. Sure. Which makes yeah. sense. It takes a lot of labor to fix it. So the pricing make, you know, it, it goes along with what I'm expecting from this, but like anyone who like who's using on camera strobes which are like basically press photographers and wedding photographers and event photographers this is going to be like going to affect them more than anyone yeah. else and the main problem is is like if it comes loose and it does pop those screws will fall into the camera body so right. they're they, like you can't even retrieve them without taking the camera apart which, which stinks you think we would have I think we would have mastered a basic metal foot by now, you know, with all the other innovations we have, IBIS and, you know, real time. Well, the argument, there was nothing wrong with the last design <laughs> where you could actually screw it from the outside. Right. But I would like to point out, even though this is the issue we came across in um, this story, they're not the only camera company that's designed their hot shoes this way. A lot of right. the new mirrorless cameras are screwed from this direction. So it's not like Canon made up this design. It's just, it's common. It just so happens that maybe it's more of an issue on Canon cameras for some reason. Well, and also you mentioned like press photographers using the shoe. Um, but because these are hybrid cameras now, I mean, people are supporting their camera with hand grips from the shoe. You see those all the time. Yeah. Monitors, like we're putting a lot more weight on the hot shoes, especially if you're not utilizing a cage. Uh, so this is going to happen more and more frequently um, for those people as well. You know, like I certainly see a lot fewer people walking around with um on camera flashes, it's almost become like a niche um, style of photography at this point. But I mean, yeah, mon you know, how often do I use a monitor and a microphone on top of my All hot shoe? It's constant, yeah. you know, on a T bracket. So a I'm going to be a little everybody. more Get wary about it. Yeah. Um, if I'm using yeah. a Canon or now I'm going to go check all the hot shoes on all my cameras, <laughs> look for a screw. If I see it, I'm safe. If not, you're going to pressure going straight in the bin. <laughs> it's going in the bin. So for, for what it's worth, this particular design is on the R5 and R6 era and all the way back down to the original EOS R. But the new R6 Mark II, I believe, has a different design because it's a different hot shoe. That's like the multi-interface shoe. So it doesn't look quite the same. But I'm not sure if this problem is has been addressed. Hang at all. on, hang on. See, it does look different, <laughs> right? Like it's got. It does, but I don't see a place to screw it. On right, it's still. still attached from the inside of the camera. So if it Boo. did come loose, it would right. it would be problematic. So, um, we'll that see. Was I, that was sitting right there. Yeah, I just I, forgot to clean up. But damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing, two things that were announced just prior to our recording of the podcast. Tamron is bringing the 35 to 150 f2 to 2.8 to Nikon Z mount. Nice. What do you guys think about that? I yeah, love that lens. lens. That lens yeah. rules. I want it in we'll, every we'll review lens it again mount as quick as possible. Yes. I want to shoot uh, multiple episodes on it. 
<laughs> that will segue nicely into a question we got this week, but I'm not going to take the bait. I'm, I'm going to okay. wait until we get to the comment section. Structure. But, Another um, then, drone. The, yeah. So basically, okay, cool. Another drone. There's a new drone seemingly <laughs> every other m- month. But there was one thing about DJI's new drone, the Air 3, that I thought was kind of cool. And I wanted to know if you guys had heard about anyone else doing anything like this. But they have like a battery hub that you can use to charge them all and also carry them with you. They're like in like this little like plastic pocket, basically. And when you're out, if two of the batteries are like, let's say at 25 or 30% and the other one is like at 50%, the hub, you can tell it rather than plugging into a wall, drain the, pre- the, the two batteries that have like less power and send that power to the one that has the most power and get that to 100% charge. Nice. From the, that makes the hub. total sense. That's yeah. Yeah. super that cool. Have you heard of that before? No, no, that's really cool. No, it's, that's a <laughs> I great no idea. Follow up. Yeah, that's <laughs> a great idea. You know, what I do like about the Air 3 as well is that we've got multiple lenses on there. And uh, I like that. I mean, I really enjoyed the DJI, uh, the Zoom. I, I love the Mavic Zoom. You know, yeah, like they're the adding more cameras lenses. to their drones more frequently now. Yeah. I think that's kind of yeah. like their thing to try and make them at least more exciting. Um, it's very I'm, cool. <sighs> flying a drone is such a pain in the butt now that like, I'm not sure I'm willing to do it for the image quality <laughs> that these sensors are giving me. Like, it's not worth it. Like, I, I would really need better. I'm Aww. wondering if we'll if we can get something much larger, much larger than a Type One, what previously known as a one inch. Like, give me give me like Micro Four Thirds or APS C. Jeremy, Jeremy Gray, one of our writers, was telling me that the optics of that are going to be prohibitive, but I don't. Yeah. That sounds just sounds like an excuse to me. That would be <laughs> that would be my concern as well. I mean, it depends how you use it because if you're shooting, a, you know, you're generally shooting a lower contrast shot with a good amount of light. Like well, one inch sensor is totally sufficient for like an establishing shot or something like that. If I want to do something like a cool shot where I'm tracking Chris or something like that, then yeah, sure, I do want a bigger sensor, maybe a little bit of separation in it. But then all you have to do is drop $16,500 on an Inspire 3 and you're off to the races. Oh, Jared. that's so all. I don't, I don't see what it. you're complaining about, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, Jared, the answer is there. You just don't want to take it. <laughs> you're right. I'm the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> like I said, short news segment this week because we spent so much time talking about space. So let's move on to tech support. <laughs> uh as I said last week, I banked a few of these, so some of these might be from a previous episode, but yeah. they are no less important. Interesting questions. We want to get to them. Yeah. So this one's probably more for Jordan. Uh, yeah. Patrick Schreiner asks, "What is better for editing, an IMAX integrated display or an external display? If it's the external display with high color accuracy, how do I know which color mode is the most accurate?" Yeah, I'm, this is a really interesting thing that I struggle with as well, because back when I was working at the camera store, I was obsessed with color accuracy. Um, like I had a, I can't even, you know, it's a decade ago, a really high end monitor for that. But I think there's some real differences. I think if you're a photographer, a color accurate display is incredibly important if you're going to print. Otherwise, it's the most infuriating activity <laughs> imaginable. Video is a lot tougher for me because it's always going to be viewed on a screen, right? There's no permanent way. There's no control. I'm not sending a DCP out to movie theaters to make sure that it's properly going to be displayed. So what I have over time moved over to doing is using, you know, like I have an iMac behind me, which is not even an HDR display. Uh, Make sure it looks good on that. Make sure it looks good on my phone. Those are the two things I'll check when I'm publishing something because chances are no one is going to be viewing it on a properly color calibrated display. Like the number of people doing that is going to be incredibly small. Most displays are going to dump a lot of contrast um, into that image. Uh, So just the process of grading it, you can wind up with an image that looks, you know, uh, over contrasty once you put it on a more consumer level display. So that's the solution that I've worked with. Um, However, you know, if I'm working on a larger project, um, like back, I remember when we were doing TV commercials, Chris, 
uh, that was all done like on, you know, a proper, I believe it was an NEC, like calibrated monitor. Same thing when we fired off um, some of our, one of our wooden nickels that was shown in a movie theater, same thing there, because there are controls in place for that. But for the vast yeah. majority of stuff that's going to be consumed online, there aren't, you know, we're kind of out in the woods with video a little bit that way. So that's why I've decided to go the way that I want to. We had a back and forth about color grading in the early days. Every early days, every week we had a discussion about color grading. Twice all a of week, us are using we, different monitors. We, we publish two times a week. Yes, exactly. Everyone's looking at the episodes on different displays. I don't know what you're talking about because the Gigabyte Arrow here has a beautiful 4K display. It has multiple AI covered profiles for both my creative work or my gaming or my movie viewing and it automatically loads those up so this episode right. not brought to you by <laughs> but uh, it is a really nice screen i really like it <laughs> second question that i want you guys to a- answer today and this is the one that i could have segued to is uh from emmanuel alvarez i've heard rumors that the sony emat is among the smallest mounts and according to most rumors it was mm. from the beginning made for aps-c it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about the different lens mount sizes and how it affects image quality. Is it something to consider when choosing a camera system or not? Oh man, we need yeah. Mark Weir right now to do 35 <laughs> minutes. I yeah, do want to say, Chris. I think that there's basically no reason why the size of the mount would matter. That's well, my understanding. I, I, yeah, first off, I love Mark Weir from Sony and he, he'll often say like, and we were able to make this lens despite having our small lens mount. I mean, it's really quite funny. I, I think the truth of it is having a larger lens mount, having it closer flange to the sensor, these are beneficial in terms of how you design lenses. It does give you more room to play. It gives you more flexibility. But at the same time, uh, you can work around it. You can design around it. I think Nikon, you know, they really push their large Z mount. Um, as being very big, very large, very close to the sensor. And then they came out with the Noct uh, as a way to really showcase like, oh, look what we can do. But I don't think it's as big a deal. Yes, I think it's a benefit for lens design in some ways, but I don't think it's as big a deal as people make it out to be. I certainly, to answer the second part of the question, would not necessarily make that one of my deciding factors for which camera brand to go with. Yeah, I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding. Like if we were seeing one you know, manufacturer, like say Nikon's lens designs were worlds ahead of what companies with a smaller uh, throat with that's closer to this or further away from the sensor. But I mean, Sony is making a bunch of class leading lenses. Sure. So is Canon right now. And so is Nikon, honestly, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think Sony has a knocked. I don't, I don't think they've got that, uh, your favorite <laughs> yeah, lens to it? refer to. <laughs> but their 50 mil one too is every bit as good as the Nikon one. And it's smaller yeah. where you would think it would be the exact opposite given everything there. Um, and one thing I do really want to push back on that I see in advertising all the time is Nikon and Canon saying, and now you can use APS-C, uh, you can use our APS-C um, bodies and take advantage of the wide throat on the lens mount. It has Absolutely. no advantage if you're using a smaller area like that. The big advantage is, you know, the light, you don't want it pushing right up against the edge of the lens mount, especially with wide angle lenses. But there is no benefit on those APS-C cameras to having that much yeah. wider mount. It gives you access to, you know, future proof full frame lens designs. But uh, no, that's something that I, yeah, argue with reps every time they come in, you know, and say yeah. our APS-C camera as well, you get the benefits of that big wide mount, like. And is somebody going to come out with a larger than full frame sensor with, but smaller than medium format sensor, you know, like some midway sensor size? I don't think so, right? To benefit from the larger. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it's an issue to worry about. But yeah, if I was a lens is- designer, like a third party lens designer, yeah, maybe I'd be frustrated that, you know, I don't know. Well, lens the one big thing smaller, is I got to accommodate everybody. That All might right. be frustrating. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the one big advantage is adaptability. You know, you can actually put E-mount lenses on a Z because that's a very short flange back. That is a real benefit if you want to, you know, yeah. have as many lens options as possible. And one thing we should remember is like mirrorless lens designs are very close to the sensor. So in the future, a lot of these, we won't be able to adapt to different, um, you know, camera systems, uh, where if you think that might be a possibility in the future, then yes, the Z mount will probably be the most adaptable followed by the RF and then the E mount. Um, 
and somewhere in there's the L mount. I got to get some measuring tape out and figure that. I out. would really go way off of like what's the lineup of lenses for each brand, what's available to you, does it has the optics that you want, and if that's the case, go for it. Well, I don't have a dedicated section for it this week because I was afraid we were going to run out of time. But I I do want to give you the opportunity, Chris, to talk <laughs> about what's on your desk. I'll keep it short. Oh yeah, so for our space themed. Uh, uh, episode, I thought I'd bring out my little Celestron Dobsonian. It's a cute little uh, telescope. Everybody should have one of these 76 millimeters. Um, I also have an 8-inch Dobsonian somewhere buried under the crawl space. It's it's heavy to bring out. But yeah, I mean, it's it's something that's enjoyable for the kids. I ended up using it just to see the moon, see Jupiter, see the, the four moons. Like it's, it's amazing stuff. Like uh, it really is. And it's something that you can kind of get that wonder from your you know from the comfort of your backyard but at the same time yeah we can see these amazing photos like we just talked about like we just saw and we can watch amazing shows and you know see all these specials but really there's there's something about seeing the actual light reflecting off of these planets in our system being able to witness that with your own eye i think it's i think it's magical i remember we did a bourbon rye tasting party at chris's house and once everybody was well into it at about midnight, <laughs> Chris is like, let's go outside and look at space. And we pulled out the big one. And that yep. was a lot of fun. So it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Good party Saturn's trick. beautiful. Jupiter's beautiful. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention uh, this week in my life, I switched over to Windows 11 finally because I just got sick of the constant like, how about now? Do you want to do it in an hour? Do you want to wait an hour? Okay, but how about now? Can we update it? And I was just like, oh, fine. Just do it. So uh, Windows 11, the experience is pretty much the same. It took me a while to copy and paste with an icon rather than a right click. And uh, yes, I know I could use a hotkey. And uh, I don't like that the start menu is in the middle. Maybe I can change it at some point. It seems like a silly I thing. Also but don't otherwise, like it's fine. I also don't yeah. like that. But All right. Um, Jordan, you have anything you want to talk about? Dude, I saw Barbie. And Barbie yeah. owns bones. <laughs> Barbie rules. Uh, I saw that you with- threaded that. Yeah, I uh, I went with uh, my wife and Chris's wife. Chris was unable to join us, sadly. Um, but I'm a huge Greta Gerwig fan. Um, Lady Bird, I think, is a masterpiece. And then <laughs> Little Women is probably the best literary adaptation to a screenplay that I could come up with. Uh, just completely made it its own thing in the movie. So I'm like, what? She's made two masterpieces. She starred in a bunch of my favorite like little indie movies, like Frances Ha, this black and white movie about a failed dancer. And it's like, what's her next logical step? Of course, it's to make a movie based on Mattel <laughs> toys. Um, <laughs> but it is exactly what I would have expected from her. Like it's incredibly yeah. subversive. Um, you do not, the trailers do not tell you what this movie is going to be. Uh, like, I can't believe Mattel put their name on a thing where like one of the key scenes is her showing up at Mattel HQ and it's just a bunch of dudes staring back at her. And it's like, <laughs> you are the people in charge of Barbie. And it's like, yes, we had a woman back in the eighties. Uh, <laughs> okay, it sounds like I need to go see this movie. It is. Yeah. It's such a good time. Uh, and yeah, yeah totally cool. not what you're expecting. And Ryan Gosling, I'm putting at the top of my best supporting actor this year. He plays He's the first good. half of the movie as a himbo and then discovers masculinity in the real world. And it's a complete tone shift and it is <laughs> incredibly funny and uh, it's, it's beautiful. So anyways, wow. it's a very fun movie. I will see Oppenheimer, but in Calgary, the 70 mil projector is not working. So once they get that yeah. sorted out, I want to see it the way it was intended to be seen. So I'll check that so out. So not on your iPhone on a flight. Yeah, like not on a. That's what. I, that's how I watched Tenet, and I'm pretty sure that's exactly what Christopher Nolan had in mind when he made that. <laughs> he movie. just got his head in his hands. I don't know. I watched it on it. a big screen. It wasn't that much better. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get on to the uh, never read the comment section, and for the first time, someone has actually taken advantage of our audio uh, message right. system. So <gasps> I'm gonna I'm gonna play that for you all now. Hello. I have a question about lens reviews and whether or not a lens review is specific to the camera it was tested on. I saw a review on the Petapixel for the Sigma 18 to 50, which was tested on at Sony. I was wondering if the test results would be the same for other camera bodies. In my case, the Fuji X-T5. Thanks. Uh, so ba- essentially, yes. Um, the, the lens should be operating and, and delivering results in a very similar way. Uh, of course, though, there was going to be the difference with the sensor. So obviously color will change. Um, color profiles if you're using those how they're going to change the the photo the megapixel count yada 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 but yeah no the lens optically should behave very similarly 
Yeah, you can gain a lot of it, but uh, at the end of all of our reviews, we always try to bring up some comparables, and that's where it can be important to look for the lens in the mount um, that you're actually in. Uh, like recently, we looked at the Tamron 11 to 20 mil, which we'd previously looked at for Sony, and this is back when Sony had terrible APS-C ultra-wide lens options. It's improved a lot since then. But then comparing it to Fujifilm, you're obviously looking at a different series of lenses with you know yeah. different benefits. So in that case, I do think it's valuable to look at it. But if you're looking purely in terms of you know, resolution, as long as the camera that was tested is similar or better resolution than what you have, then I think the results are absolutely applicable. The only other differentiator there might be autofocus. And a lot of the time that comes down to the camera body. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, hey, a lot of these Sony lenses seem to focus incredibly quick, but some of that might just be down to the fact that the camera is snapping focus very quickly as well. Um, but generally, I think it's absolutely useful to still look at lens reviews in other makes um and if thanks anyone would for like calling in that's so cool <laughs> that question was from michael so yeah we're really anyone can use this there's a link in the uh podcast description and in the youtube description and we'll even put it on petapixel.com on the story um on any of our podcasts you can use uh, it's called speak pipe you can send us any message nice. uh and uh we have the those are vetted by someone that is not any of us so if you send us something crude they uh they never get to our ears. So uh, keep, keep it civil. But otherwise, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, all right. I got five more questions for you uh, that are yeah, based on the last through. two uh, shows you've done. First one is on the uh, camera companies one that, you, that uh, Chris, where you were lamenting everything. Oh, they're one all thing doing I hate. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So one person, this isn't really a question, but it's something that you didn't bring up. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. The one thing that all of these companies have in common are their apps. They're all <laughs> profoundly frustrating and unreliable, says yeah. David Stachin. Their editing softwares that they make that are proprietary are typically slow and buggy as well. I mean, I, I agree. There you go. I, you know, it's just, but then it'd be a short video. It'd be the worst thing about every camera brand, the apps, and then you're, you're done, right? That's thanks for joining us. See you next time. Yeah, on thanks for joining us. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, I mean, let's be honest. Some companies have worked on them. Like a Photos isn't that bad. Uh, Fuji Films, is, I think, has gotten better. But, you know, they just I will admit. They a brand new one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing good things. Mm -hmm. Hearing good things. But Sony as a did camera too, viewer, right? The, the Creators Cloud, not to be confused with Adobe Creative Cloud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the name is unfortunate, so they need to revamp yeah. that app as well. I want a new version. <laughs> you know, it's called as a camera Sony reviewer, app for your camera that you own. That's what they should we, call it. <laughs> we got to take a look at them again. We have to start. But as a camera reviewer, I will say straight up, I'm sure, Jaren, you probably feel a similar way in Jordan. It's like any time that we get to a press conference and they talk about the apps, I think we all just tune out because we're like, please, God, no, don't do this to us. Don't make <laughs> us open it up. Don't make us try to use it on camera. Like, I just don't want to. Because yeah. it has historically been a real... It's bad. Yeah, and it's it, bad. like I like the idea of sending pictures that I'm taking on a camera to my phone. I'm just not willing to go through the effort that they make me to do that. It's it's usually it pretty terrible. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, long story short, we agree. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, Louis Moran asks or says, if you have a choice between the Lumix G9, the Canon M6 Mark II, or the Sony A6100 for photography mainly, which would you recommend? I'm just a hobbyist that wants a good camera that can take great pictures. Thanks for your help. Oh, uh, Lumix G9, one. Canon M6 Mark II, Sony A6100. Go, Chris. If it's for... Yeah, if it's for photography mainly, this is a tough question. I mean, I like all three of those cameras, so I, I don't think you're going to go wrong. The G9, absolutely a beautiful camera, actually really good value for the dollar. It got great firmware updates, not recently, but fairly recently. And it's like, it's bigger though. You know, it's great for wildlife, sports, shooting, it's fast. The multi-shot capability is neat. So it would definitely suit somebody who maybe want to do more outdoor work. <sighs> the Sony a6100, the EVF is terrible. I mean, worst. it's it's the worst. But the ca and the camera's infinitely unsexy. But the autofocus works great. It takes great images. There's nothing missing from it, capability wise. Um, even does okay video. So I would say that is definitely a solid choice. My favorite of the three would actually be the M6 Mark II. I love that camera. I thought it was handsome. Felt great. Handsome. Liked the controls. It autofocused well. Uh, I love all those little lenses. It's just scary that you're buying into a what could very well be a defunct lens mount. Right? Well, I mean, if you get the lenses you want, why does great. it matter? You've but got you'll them. never get more than that. Like right. you know. But if you're a hobbyist, you just want like a small kit that you can carry around, and you want some lenses. Yeah, it's great. I love that camera. 
I, I mean, one Absolutely. thing I would definitely touch on is your shooting style. If you like to use the electronic viewfinder, as Chris mentioned, the 6100 is trash. The M6 <laughs> Mark II, it's an optional, uh, fairly expensive yeah. add-on accessory, and it's still a very middle-of-the-road EVF. Um, the G9 where the G9 great. has a beautiful display on it. Uh, so Absolutely. that would certainly be something I would factor in just based on your own personal shooting style. Yeah. I can and see I mean, the G9, of, of the three <laughs> cameras, the G9 is going to be, I would say, the one capable of tackling more serious photography, serious photography, you know, wildlife, sports, outdoor rugged stuff, that kind of thing. But All right. Uh, Final questions. This, these last three relate to your R6 II versus A7 IV video. Uh, Sam O'Hara asks... Question is, which of those two would Jordan pick, or would he bring in a third contender? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I do really like the R6 II. Um, it, it's a camera. I've been actually shooting a lot of stills with it. I enjoy it for that. But Canon's weird decisions with video always just make me not want to shoot with their cameras, not having a histogram when I'm rolling, not having a level when I'm rolling. If I shoot slow motion, it returns the camera to 1080 60 P when I leave slow motion <laughs> mode, which is a mode I would yeah, never use a in a camera that can shoot 4k 60. Uh, I don't like working with C log three. I understand like C log two is for cameras with more dynamic range, but I just have a tough time getting color exactly where I need it with C log three um, and haven't found like a perfect LUT for that, that I'm really happy with. So I would go for the Sony, even though the rolling shutter on that absolutely drives me crazy. The stabilizer is not the best on it. Um, and I find that's a great camera photographically as well. Like the extra resolution is really nice to have. Uh, I would give it the, you know, image quality, edge there. And I like working with S log three a lot more than C log three. So for me, I would go for the Sony understanding fully that on paper, the R6 two, <laughs> especially with it's like uncropped 4k 60 is great to have. I just don't love shooting with that camera. But let's be honest, you go Panasonic S5 II, wouldn't you, Jordan? Always, every day. It's <laughs> filming me right now. Look at this. Yeah, Luscious. It's like, I had no idea you liked that camera since every episode that you've published for <laughs> Petapixel has been shot on that camera. There are the exceptions. I have shot on the Z8 multiple yeah. times and the XS20 the other day, <laughs> okay. last week. Right. So come right. on, I'm mixing it up. But <laughs> all, all right, things this being equal, I'm using an S5 II. Uh, Kurt Barker asks, it seems the main camera brands have all similar bodies at similar price ranges, and it comes down to lens compatibility. What brand has the best range of native lenses? It seems Sony has a very good range. Kurt Barker, you've answered your own question. It's true. I mean, Sony really does have a fantastic lens lineup. So does Fuji. You know, Fujifilm's uh, APS-C line of lenses is quite extensive. But Sony has not only a great native lens range, but they also have a great invasive lens range i don't know i think i believe it's third party is the <laughs> yeah. word you're looking for oh third party yeah i like i'm gonna go with invasive from now on so Sigma's sony's one of my preferred invasive, invasive line of lenses. Lens <laughs> yeah invasive lenses <laughs> sony's line of invasive lenses is incredibly uh incredibly robust so i would say yes yeah, sony has probably one of the best lens lineups um canon we've talked about they we'd like to see improvements the expensive lens they have are great but now that they're shutting down third party support we're really missing out on a lot of affordable stuff uh, Nikon's doing a great job though. They're fleshing it out. It's getting there. And, uh, honestly, like micro four thirds, the Alliance, you've got a lot of choices there too. L mount actually has a lot too. So, but Sony is the top right now, I would say for invasive and non-invasive lenses. I concur. <laughs> All right. Final question for both of you. Uh, if you were going to pick between the Sigma 150 to 600 F5 to 6.3 or the Tamron 150 to 500 F5 mm. to 6.7, which would you pick? I this have a strong opinion. Oh, wait, sorry, <laughs> before you answer, I actually need to point out this guy's name. Uh, his his YouTube name is perfect for Chris. It's Crazy About Fly Fishing. Yeah, so I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Crazy About Fly Fishing, you actually should check out their channel. Uh, they're based out of New Zealand. They actually, their YouTube channel is killing it. They're fantastic. They take beautiful stuff, lots of like gorgeous locations, big trout. So it's it's a great channel. You should definitely follow it. Um, do you want? I'll go first, Jordan, if you're okay with that. Yeah, I mean, talk yeah. to your fly fishing peeps. There you go. So this is a tough. This is a tough one because you do have two very good lenses, and I would normally say extra length is always is always the trump card like you know it's important if you can get extra length especially concerning the sigma is actually faster at 600 than the tamron is at 500 i would say that's the way to go 90 percent of the time but 
The Tamron does have some serious benefits. Um, the Sigma's got a 95 mil filter thread on there. That's huge. I know you're going to want to use polarizers for the work that you're doing. So <laughs> the Tamron 150 to 500 gives you 82 millimeter filters. Definitely more common. Definitely more affordable in a huge way. I didn't even know um, 95 was an option. I'm, I'm being totally yeah. real with you. <laughs> But it's a rare option, so anytime you buy lenses for that, they're ridiculous. Um, the Tamron is slightly lighter, not much, like just over a couple hundred grams. Not a big deal, just over a tenth of an oct, but it is lighter. It is a little bit shorter. Uh, it actually has less lens breathing, and I know you guys are doing a lot of video work, so if you are focusing, um, you'll find the Tamron actually breathes less. Um, and the general consensus, consensus actually is the Sigma's autofocusing, while not slow, is actually slightly slower than the Tamron. So... I would maybe in this case for the fly fishing stuff, if that's what you're going for, the Tamron 150 to 500 would be my choice. You know, I'm actually going to mention one feature you didn't touch on there, Chris. The Sigma has the ability to loosen up the zoom ring enough that you yeah. can actually use it as a push-pull lens, which is something I love doing. I know Chris despises it, but I actually find that's that probably very why natural. he didn't mention it. Yeah. Um, I really like that. And um, if you're hand-holding video, I actually find you'll – screw up your frame a little bit less if you do have to zoom in a shot uh, just doing like a push pull mid shot as opposed to yanking the zoom ring uh, so that would certainly be my preference in that but as chris said you know it is a faster lens at the long end for not that much uh size penalty so i'd probably lean towards the sigma as well oh now you're gonna have to pick you're gonna have to pick between the two of us <laughs> well, there you go um Team all Tamron. right run uh <laughs> <laughs> the, they, you guys have provided them with uh, with no answer to their question because you did not agree, but that's okay. I'm sure you gave them the information they needed. Um, we're going to call that the episode for this week. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks to OM System for sponsoring the episode. Uh, we'll catch you all next yeah. week. Thanks to uh, Elisa and Joe for being our special guests. They, they were great. I hope you guys enjoyed that segment, too. Bye.